Probably she a dime Demon girl, evil eyes She be telling lies Today, it is my pleasure to interview Dr. Harold Barmis, the co-recipient of the 1989 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine <clears throat> and the former director of the NIH. Thank you for being part of this episode, uh, Dr. Barmis. In light of such a successful career, can you start with you taking us back and telling us about your educational background? Okay, well, it's a, that's, a, that's a longer story, but there are a few essential um, features of it that I think might be of interest, especially to... Uh, people out there who are still in high school or college and are thinking about careers with, uh, um, with a good deal of uncertainty about directions in which to, to go. Um, I like to think that one of the advantages of being um, in the U.S. is the opportunity to have what I call a prolonged adolescence. That is a, a fairly long period of time in which you explore a lot of fields and finally uh, come to um, some decision after, after testing the waters in lots of domains. Um, I grew up um, in a, what, in, at least in my circles, was considered a fairly uh, conventional setting. My parents were the children of immigrants and they had that incredible immigrant experience in the 1920s and 30s of um, coming, uh, having been born to parents who were struggling in Europe, um, got to this country, entered into various kinds of occupations, didn't make much money, weren't highly educated, but their children, my parents, uh, went off to Ivy League colleges. Uh, my father was a, was a Harvard undergraduate who then uh, went to medical school at Tufts uh, and uh, set up a, a practice of family medicine in uh, my mother's hometown, Freeport, New York. My mother uh, came from a slightly more affluent background. My father's family was uh, um, particularly poor because his mother had died in the influenza pandemic in 1919, and his father never really had a uh, high paying education. My mother, in contrast, um, grew up um, in a family that had prospered uh, selling clothing. Um, she went to Wellesley, became a psychiatric social worker. Um, and, um, but as the first male child of uh, an upwardly mobile family, there was some expectations that I would go on to be like my father, uh, a physician. Um, that that uh, prediction was uh, um, further enhanced by the fact that um, my parents were both Jewish, and there was a, 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 a very high frequency of, of um, studious uh, Jewish children, especially males in those days, uh, to become become doctors. And you know, I went along with that. But uh, the fact is that as a high school student, I was never particularly interested in science. I spent a lot of time reading novels and uh, being interested in the arts. Um, and uh, when it came time to go to college, uh, I, choose, I chose to go to a small liberal arts college in Massachusetts, Amherst College, uh, where um, uh, it was expected that everybody would explore a lot of fields of, uh, of learning and not simply plunge into a direct route to a career. And uh, like everybody else in my class at that time, uh, we all took a very wide array of courses in the humanities and the arts, as well as the sciences. During that period, I became quite interested in first in philosophy, then in uh, English literature, uh, and in fact, uh, I ran, ran the, the school newspaper. I took the minimum number of science courses enough so that I could apply for medical school if I wanted to. By the time I was a senior, I was pretty confused about my career directions. I was enjoying uh, being uh, being a, a college journalist. I was uh, in love with um, um, my thesis topic of, uh, from my uh, English uh, major, namely a, 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 a study of Charles Dickens. Uh, and um, I decided to apply to graduate school in English. I was successful in getting a fellowship to go to Harvard and I did that. Um, and during that year of study, um, I became a little uh, disenchanted with the idea of spending my life um, uh, working in literature. And I found that my 
classmates from Amherst, uh, many of whom were then at Harvard Medical School, were having a much better time than I was most days. So I decided I would uh, take a retreat from graduate school and go to medical school, which I was able to do, despite the fact that I was turned down by Harvard Medical School for the second time. Um, but I managed to get um, accepted into a school that actually probably worked better for me, Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, because it was in New York. And New York is a great place for someone of my interest to be living as a student. Uh, during medical school, um, I discovered um, uh, the, uh, the advent of uh, molecular biology, which was then, this is the 1960s, a, a, a new field that uh, had grown up uh, as, in part as a result of the discovery of, of um, the structure of DNA and the nature of the genetic code with all of the promise that, uh, un, that learning about uh, the genetic constitution of, uh, of species, especially human beings, would have a profound effect on, on the future of medicine, as indeed it has had. Um, so at that time, um, I was interested in thinking and in, in, in considering a career uh, practicing internal medicine, watching the changes that might occur as molecular biology began to provide explanations for a wide variety of diseases. That shift had already begun to occur in the 1960s with discoveries um, in the 50s and 60s about the uh, the, the causes of certain red blood cell diseases like thalassemia and sickle cell disease. So I thought this was a good direction, but I was also living in a country that was uh, waging war in Vietnam. And to ensure that the country had enough doctors, uh, Congress had passed a, a law called the, the Berry Plan, which required that, um, that all uh, new MDs uh, serve their country or uh, either in the army or in the public health service. And, but if you were opposed to the war in Vietnam, as, as I and many of my colleagues were, uh, it was either those options or going to another country like Canada or going to jail. And I preferred to stay here and not go to jail. And so I, and I was fortunate despite the lack of any, of any um, prior experience uh, in, um, in science, uh, to uh, get a, a place at the National Institutes of Health, which is one of the several parts of the public health service. So at the age of 28, which is an advanced age these days for people who want to have a scientific career, I finally began to work seriously in a laboratory. Uh, I was very lucky to, um, to end up in the laboratory of a, of a young scientist who, like myself, had come a bit late to science was he happened to be interested in the thyroid, which was a topic that I was interested in as, some, in as somebody who um, thought endocrinology might be a useful place to work within the realm of internal medicine. But before I was able to get actually into his lab, um, my new mentor, whose name is Ira Paston, a scientist still working today at the age of 90 at the NIH, um, uh, Ira had uh, made a, an important discovery about how cyclic AMP might work in bacteria. Cyclic AMP, for those of you who don't know, is a major uh, messenger in cells that, uh, that allows um, certain gene functions to be turned on. Uh, it's, a, it's a gene regulator. Um, and uh, finding that cyclic AMP had a role in controlling the expression of a well-known gene in E. coli, a, a commonly used bacterium, had a big effect on the field of molecular biology because it showed several things. First of all, it allowed experiments in, to try to understand how a small molecule like cyclic AMP could control expression of genes. Secondly, it provided an important illustration for how uh, studying a, an interesting scientific problem in bacteria could be very illuminating about how more complex organisms like human beings might work. And uh, it also proved to be an, uh, an important way to think about uh, diseases in which regulation by cyclic AMP might be important. 
So uh, even though I decided that I was not going to work on bacterial gene regulation forever, that I was going to move back into the study of some um, a, a disease that uh, I knew something about as a consequence of going to medical school. And uh, I was taking courses at the NIH at the time, and I learned that uh, that cancer disease I was uh, familiar with and concerned about because several of my relatives have had cancer, um, that uh, there was going to, be, I could see there was going to be a revolution in the understanding of cancer, that molecular biology, and especially viruses that have been found recently uh, to um, cause cancer in animals would be important uh, techniques and tools for trying to understand uh, how a normal cell uh, is transformed into a cancer cell. So at that point, I looked for a place to work on cancer. I found one in California, and uh, that's when my the, the serious part of my career uh, was launched. Yeah, so <clears throat> you talked about your time at the NIH for the public health service during the Vietnam War. So my question was, as like a medical doctor, what do you do, I guess, during your time serving, well, technically serving in the Vietnam War? Well, I, as I made clear, I, I did not serve in the Vietnam War, except in the, in the uh, abstract sense that I was working for the U.S. government as a member of the public health service, but I was largely doing research. Now, uh, there were many of us, there were several hundred, almost, I think all of them were men, uh, working at the NIH at that time in that capacity. Um, some of us were clinical fellows as opposed to being research fellows because we had uh, uh, fairly limited research backgrounds. And uh, in fact, I was working um, part of the, each week and uh, one month a year uh, as, a, as a practicing physician taking care of patients with endocrine disorders like thyroid uh, diseases, hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Uh, but the bulk of my work and the bulk of my responsibilities were in the laboratory. And I was trying to supplement my pretty profound ignorance of what was going on in, in uh, modern molecular biology, biochemistry, and cell biology by taking courses that the NIH offered at night. So that was an you know, incredibly important part of my life, just in two years, uh, converting myself from uh, somebody whose primary interest was in the arts and who had a medical training uh, to somebody who uh, whose prime passion in life was doing experiments in a laboratory with some of the most uh, um, uh, complicated tools of modern science, molecular, <coughs> molecular hybridization and cell biology and, and enzymology. So what do you learn from your experience of getting rejected twice to um, Harvard Medical School? Apply to more than one place. Yep. Well, that seems like a pretty good lesson. During your time at UCSF, you probably focus on retroviruses. viruses. So what are retroviruses? viruses? Okay. Well, I, I can't give you a lecture on retroviruses in the time we have, but uh, uh, let me just preface this uh, brief answer by saying that that the reason I was attracted to this class of viruses that we now call retroviruses is because they were among the few viruses that had been identified as infectious agents that could cause cancer in animals. And that was an important thing because there was a lot of reason to think that cancer was a disease or a set of diseases um, that were caused by changes in our genes. And at that time, there was uh, no uh, recombinant DNA technology. There was no DNA sequencing. This was the late 1960s, the early 1970s. So if you really wanted to have any uh, uh, reasonable chance of, of identifying genes that could induce a cancer, you really had to look for ways to simplify the problem. Uh, human Genomes were then thought to have as many as 100,000 genes. The actual number, as you probably know, is around 21,000. Mm -hmm. um, but even that lower number is still a daunting number of genes to think about. Viruses of the kind that were found um, over the 
the course of the 20th century to be uh, ca cancer causing in animals usually carried only a few genes. Um, in most cases, uh, no more than five. And that po posed an opportunity. Uh, so I read the literature on the, some of the classes of viruses, some carrying their genes as RNA, some carrying their genes as DNA, to think about which virus might be the most promising avenue to learning something substantial about the genetic origins of cancer. The place um, I was most intrigued with was the, uh, uh, the studies that were being done on a virus called Rau sarcoma virus that had been discovered as early as 1910 by a young physician, Peyton Rouse at the Rockefeller Institute. And that virus had an additional uh, attraction other than the fact that it caused cancers in chickens and actually quite a few other animals. Um, and that is that the virus seemed to provide its genes to cells uh, in some uh, long-term manner, and yet the genome of the virus was RNA, not DNA. So that left only a couple of possibilities. One is that the the when the RNA got into the cell, it had some transient um, uh, uh, persistence in the in in, in the cell, but uh, left some kind of mark on the cell. The second idea would be that the RNA somehow was perpetuated in the cell. And the third idea, the radical idea, but one that had been espoused by uh, Howard Temin, who then uh, went on to win, win a Nobel Prize for his uh, his good idea, is that the, the that the virus somehow had a way of converting the information present in the RNA genome into a DNA form, which might be um, uh, then incorporated into a chromosome of the host cell and kept on in perpetuity. Now, the, the big problem with proposing that is that there had to be an enzyme that could convert RNA to DNA. And there was no such enzyme known, but he and uh, his co-recipient of the 1975 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, David Baltimore, came to the conclusion that maybe uh, the virus encoded such an enzyme, that the virus carried that enzyme into the cell. And if you looked in virus particles, you might find an enzyme that could copy a template of RNA into, in, and make it uh, into double-stranded DNA in a way that would allow the cell to read out the instructions that came with the virus, but were now in a form, namely of DNA, that could be incorporated into the host cell chromosomes. So that turned out to be right. Um, the, the discovery of reverse transcriptase proved to be an incredibly important thing, not only for understanding how retroviruses work, uh, but of course that, that enzyme in a sense was uh, the impetus for naming this virus class the retroviruses because in contrast to what everybody accepted is the, the central dogma of biology that information flowed from DNA into RNA to protein, there was a phase in which um, uh, there was a, a mechanism by which uh, information in RNA could be turned into DNA with, with an enzyme that was called reverse transcriptase. And that was the, uh, that was the um, basis on which to uh, term these viruses retroviruses, information flowed in a, in a manner that was backwards compared to the usual flow of information in cells. So you were awarded the 1989 Nobel Prize. Uh, so my question is, what were you doing and what was your reaction when you saw that you won the Nobel Prize? Well, um, you know, obviously it was a, it was a good day, but, but uh, you know, um, that was several years after the discovery had been made. We published, we made the, the discovery that, the, and let me just say what the discovery was, because we're talking about before we, get involved in the emotions attached to it. Let's say what the problem was. Um, it had been discovered by several people that, uh, that there was reason to believe that, that there was at least one gene in the Rouse sarcoma virus genome that was responsible for transformation. It wasn't at all clear why the virus would care to have such a gene, why that would be an evolutionarily um, 
uh, advantageous gene to, to carry. And, you know, in thinking about how viruses evolved, it's useful. I mean, if we all do that now in the midst of the COVID pandemic, uh, we all, we like to think that uh, the reason that um, viruses evolve the way they have and carry the, the genetic information that they carry is because it gives them a selective advantage um, so that they grow better than, than other viruses and begin to dominate the population of, uh, of viruses infecting, in this case, human beings. Um, and it wasn't at all apparent why a virus would want to carry a gene that caused cancer, uh, where that gene might come from. And it turned out that you know, one of the ideas, I can't go to the history of, of, of uh, what might have been, but uh, one of the ideas was on the table and one that we knew we could test directly with some, um, some hybridization methods, molecular hybridization methods that we had developed was the possibility that that the gene that allows a virus to cause cancer was acquired from a normal cellular gene. And that uh, in the course of, of capturing the cellular gene, it underwent some changes that would account for the um, cancer causing properties of the virus carried, carried by uh, Rouse sarcoma virus. And the idea would be that this may not have provided any particular advantage to the virus, but that as a scientist like Peyton Rouse would find that virus in a cancer and uh, begin to work with it. And that's exactly what happened. This, this, the, the Rouse sarcoma virus is not a particularly um, useful virus that would dominate in an evolutionary sense, um, but we were able to take that virus and use it as a tool to isolate, uh, let's identify and later isolate the cellular gene that uh, provides normal functions, important normal functions for cells. Indeed, these functions are so valuable to the organisms that they're very highly conserved. But in the, in the, in the wake of uh, mutations that affect uh, the behavior of the, of the gene product, namely the protein made by the SARC gene, it might become um, uh, an agent that would um, uh, change the behavior of the cell and allow it to grow into a tumor. And uh, our um, breakthrough moment, if you will, was finding uh, a gene very closely related to the viral transforming gene, which was called viral SARC. And the cellular homolog of viral SARC, the, the, the likely progenitor, proved to be very closely related, made a very similar protein. Uh, the proteins had an enzymatic activity um, that added um, phosphate to, um, to tyrosine in target proteins. And that these activities were closely related to the, the um, uh, transforming activity of the virus. Now, this is not all our work. Our, our major contribution was finding the gene and showing we could identify it and showing that the gene was highly conserved during evolution. But many people, of course, were attracted into this area. And that's one of the, one of the virtues of the way science works is people make a discovery. The discovery is uh, uh, transmitted by talks and by papers. And uh, if it's interesting, other people will jump in and help out with, to solve the problem. And uh, there, a lot of people jumped onto this and uh, we had a lot of company. Uh, one of the other interesting features is that it turns out that while we were working on Rouse sarcoma virus, there were indeed uh, quite a lot of other retroviruses that carried different genes that they had acquired from normal host cells. And those genes were also competent once mutated to, uh, to, to cause cancers in animals and in cultured cells in Petri dishes. And uh, work that was done to a certain extent by us, but by many others as well, uh, led to the, the definition of isolation of a large number of genes that were potentially human cancer genes. And indeed, one of the things that made uh, our discovery important and interesting to the Nobel Prize Committee was that uh, some of these genes were actually mutated in human cancers that that were, had never been infected by any kind of virus. They simply 
were cancers that arose because mutations occurred by processes that we now um, understand much better than we did then. Uh, and when they were in their mutant forms, those genes um, had the potential to trigger uh, cancerous growth. So the idea that a, a retrovirus uh, well before the Human Genome Project was even being discussed could lead us to the identification of genes that are important in human cancer, um, much of that work being done by others, not by us, made our original discovery uh, particularly important. And uh, you know we were very pleased to see the recognition that we received for this, but um, you know, the work is done not for the Nobel Prize. That, that would be foolish. But the work is done in hopes of making discoveries and having the pleasure of uh, learning new things. Um, we got a good taste of that. And then when, uh, when um, Stockholm called, um, obviously we felt gratification. It certainly changed my life to a very major extent because um, I had been up to that point uh, somebody working hard and doing some good things in the laboratory, but had never been uh, particularly identified with, uh, with leadership in science. Indeed, I was not an especially good citizen at the medical school I worked at, uh, University of California, San Francisco. I pretty much did my teaching and, ran, and uh, ran my lab, but was not um, in any sense an administrator, not even a department chair, and uh, yet, the Nobel Prize has the, um, the one characteristic of the Nobel Prize is that it makes you prominent. And uh, sometimes people um, accept that prominence uh, as, uh, as though it were um, actually uh, something that was conferring new talents on you. And it's just basically uh, in, enlarging your microphone, mm -hmm. but I was given a chance to to get interested in in the management of science, and um, I think there's a pretty direct connection between um, becoming a Nobel laureate and uh, my uh, becoming uh, the NIH director a few years later. Yeah, so <clears throat> you were the 14th um, National Institute of Health director. So my question is, why do you decide to become an um, an um, NIH director instead of like of other positions? Well, um, it, what really wasn't a question of becoming an NIH director as opposed to becoming the director of something else. Um, the choice for me was whether I was going to remain in, in uh, one of the most uh, fruitful and enjoyable uh, atmospheres in which to do science, namely the University of California, San Francisco in the late 80s, early 90s, which was a hotbed of discovery with a very congenial group of people. Science was really fun to do. I was living in a, in a, in a wonderful city and, uh, uh, and had a, a large lab, many collaborators. Um, you know, it, was, it was scientific nirvana, but you know, I had always had interest in other things, in, in politics and the arts and, um, and uh, um, and I also have uh, a conviction that, that uh, people who benefited from uh, the system of sci for scientific research that we have in the U.S. ought to find some way to give back to the scientific community. Um, furthermore, at that time, the NIH was under some stress. The, uh, the, the success rate for grant applicants had gone down. Uh, the intramural program at the NIH, where I had been trained, uh, was getting very highly criticized. Um, there were threats to the independence of the NIH and to its commitment to basic research that I found troubling. Uh, there were uh, some scandals that had been uh, undermining the reputation of the NIH. And for all those reasons, I was concerned about the future of the institution, which had nurtured my own career, not just by training me initially, but by giving me grants and uh, career development awards, uh, staging meetings and uh, uh, and I uh, began to recognize that that one of the reasons American biomedical science had begun to outpace uh, the previous leaders in Europe. Um, and I felt uh, if I could make a contribution to uh, leading this institution in a way that wouldn't undermine its basic values, but would restore some of its reputation, that I should do it. And actually, I found it very interesting to do. And one... Um, my um, 
the, the, the political leaders in the department I'd be joining in, in, in the U.S. government showed an interest in my taking on the job, um, I signed up and I'm glad I did. It, uh, I was allowed to keep my laboratory work going, albeit at a reduced pace um, with a smaller group, but I was able to continue being a scientist and being in touch with, with the issues in, in, um, in cancer and retrovirology. Um, and uh, I didn't really turn back. I spent, as you probably know from reading my bio, I spent about six years running the NIH and in, in good times, interesting times, times when uh, we built a lot of new buildings at the NIH, we expanded the NIH budget very dramatically. Um, we dealt with some incredibly interesting problems like molecular cloning and the growth of the Human Genome Project and new therapies for cancer and AIDS and heart disease. Um, and that was all very invigorating. Uh, and then after that, I, I decided to take a leadership job in a different sector by becoming the head of the Sloan Kettering Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, uh, which was also very stimulating. I was able to do more research of my own, but importantly, I was able to run and greatly expand the research efforts at, at uh, one of the best cancer centers in the world. And after leaving that, um, after 10 years of working there, I was invited to go back and, and to the NIH and run the National Cancer Institute. And that too is well, not the number one job on campus, but in some ways a more interesting job because I was actually directly giving out money and creating new programs for doing research in the field that I've finally espoused as my own, namely cancer research. So, you know, there's, there was a logical progression from doing some science that proved to be incredibly interesting to winning a prize that made me better known uh, to taking on leadership positions that uh, allowed me to influence the way in which uh, three important institutions do their work. Yeah, so my question is, did it felt weird becoming a director of an individual institute within the NIH when like you were the former director of, of the NIH? I'm not sure what the question is. So my question is, you were the 14th director of the NCI, right? Yes. So, so why you decide to become like the director of an individual institute within the NIH? Yeah. Okay, the fair enough. Sure. Um, well, when I was director of the entire NIH, um, while I enjoyed the job for most of the time, I also recognized that I didn't have um, much authority over specific research programs. Uh, the NIH director has a very small budget. Almost all the money that goes to the NIH is allocated to the individual institutes and centers of which there are roughly 25. And uh, I often felt frustrated because there were programs that I would like to see started or expanded or even diminished that uh, I didn't have direct control over because of the way the money is given directly to the directors of the institutes. And the NIH director has a role in setting general policy, but it requires a lot of persuasion to get multiple institute directors to band together and spend their money in ways that the NIH director would like to do. So that creates an attention that I got somewhat tired of. I, I enjoyed being the, the leader of the entire NIH, it got me um, access to um, the leaders in the White House and, and uh, leaders in Congress. And I was the point person for discussions of, of broad scientific policy, but I wasn't running the NIH research programs. And uh, I, I began to feel frustrated by that. So that was one of the reasons I left after about six years. Um, I felt I had done what I could do. Uh, the NIH was then on a course for doubling over five years, uh, doubling its budget for over five years. And um, I wanted to go do something which my hands got um, more deeply into the nature of research. And then that was something I did first 
at Memorial Sloan Kettering. But then when there was an opening at the National Cancer Institute, I and I was offered the position, I decided that you know, I really didn't care whether I was the number one person on campus. What I wanted to do was to have influence over scientific programs. The NCI budget was then over $5 billion, lots of interesting programs and in training of scientists, building cancer centers and maintaining them, um, uh, producing uh, grants that would be interesting for people to pursue. And... Uh, uh, providing, ensuring that there was adequate money for people who had their own ideas that the NIH would, might not ever think about, but uh, providing ways for, for people to compete for adequate amounts of money that uh, could support the original ideas that um, many cancer investigators would have on their own. Those were all appealing concepts to me. And I thought I had some tools that would let me um, uh, create some new opportunities, suggest new ways to work together and uh, have my hands directly on a five plus billion dollar budget and do some good things for cancer research. And I think that is what happened. Now, you might point out, I only did that job for five years and it was a, a directly personal reason for that. Um, my wife would grown up in, in in Washington, didn't want to move back there. She wanted to stay in New York. So I commuted every week and uh, five years of commuting by train up and back each week uh, can be a bit wearing. And uh, I was tired of the, of the commute, it was constraining. And uh, I decided after five years that I had done the things I wanted to do that someone else could take over and pursue them. And indeed that's happened. And um, I would, go back and, and uh, run my own lab and uh, do some other things in New York, be an advisor to, to companies and to um, research institutions of various kinds. And I've been doing that. That's still the bulk of my life. Um, at this point, I, I'm not running anything except my own fairly small lab. Um, but uh, I work for the World Health Organization for the New York City mayor and and um, the efforts that New York City is making to expand biotechnology in the commercial sector. Uh, I, I advise uh, the Broad Institute and the Crick Institute and um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and many other things. So I feel as I'm in the middle of things, I work for the New York Genome Center and help them build programs to study rare cancers and study cancers in traditionally understudied communities. So there's a lot to do. And you know, once you have built a reasonable reputation for uh, both your administrative abilities and your scientific judgment, it's not difficult to get gigs like that that, that uh, help you have an influence without actually having to either commute to Washington or to, uh, to take on the administrative details of running an, organ an organization mm -hmm. and be a, be a manager. So you also established the PubMed Central uh, do you think more scientists should be following your footsteps to make sure most scientific papers are open source? Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up that topic. And there's a history to this. It's not just um, uh, founding PubMed Central. Um, but uh, let me just give you a little bit of background on this. Um, in um, Among the scientific disciplines, biology and medicine have been slow to take advantage of the internet to share their findings. There are many reasons for that. I don't want to go into them, but I would say to anybody who wants to learn more that I've written extensively about this in a memoir called The Art, the, the, um, the Art and Politics of Science that uh, you don't need to buy. It's available for free online through the National Library of Medicine, and you can find it quite readily. But uh, the, the basic point here is that I felt there had to be some new ways to, to think about how scientists exchange results with each other. After all, most of us are funded by the federal government. Um, we have a responsibility to the citizens of the country and indeed the citizens of the world to share our findings. We know that uh, sharing findings quickly is a good thing. It allows new collaborations to develop. And yet um, we had uh, allowed 
journals that were making a lot of money by selling subscriptions to the very fine products that they were making, um, but that there were ways that it would be possible to speed up and uh, the delivery of information and to make access much more widely known. After all, there are an awful lot of people who care about the results of biomedical research who are not doctors or researchers, perhaps not even patients, but um, public access to work that's public, publicly supported seems like a, a very wise thing to do. So there were three things in the long run that I think have been important. One is building a public digital library like, the, like PubMed Central, which you already mentioned. PubMed Central is simply an outgrowth of of an, uh, a um, um, something called PubMed, which is a an NIH-supported inventory of uh, virtually all papers, titles, authors, and abstracts. And of course, for many people, that's not enough. You really want to see the full text of the paper. And I thought building a a, a digital library that everybody could access uh, would provide a much greater much greater ability for everyone to see the product of government supported science. Secondly, it seemed to me that, that it was possible to use the internet to allow people to look at uh, papers even before they had been reviewed. We now know that the review process can take months, sometimes years. And uh, if you have to wait for reviewers to be made happy about a manuscript, um, before you allow the public to look at it, you can pretty dramatically slow down the uh, the access of people of the of readers, potential readers to information. And the third idea was to make journals um, available uh, with a new business model, um, making the journals fully accessible from the time of publication by having the authors who have funds, from their funding agencies um, pay for the cost of, uh, of editing and reviewing uh, papers that are submitted to the journals. So the journals wouldn't close, they would simply change their business plan. And that's something that we started in an organization called the Public Library of Science, which is basically a publishing house that um, was begun by me and two close, close colleagues, Michael Eisen and, and Pat Brown in 2003 to produce what are called open access journals that, uh, that make their money from fees paid by the authors and by the authors uh, funding agencies and then go immediately online and take, taking all the advantages of publishing in electronic forms. So all three areas have become successful with time. The public PubMed Central, the public uh, library, um, took some time to work out because journals were reluctant to provide their content even after a one-year delay. Um, but Congress ultimately commanded that NIH-supported authors put their content, their published content, into PubMed Central within a year of publication. So that has allowed PubMed Central to become a huge repository of virtually everything published over the last 30 or 40 years. And that has been tremendously beneficial for working scientists. They don't need to go to, to physical libraries anymore. Full text of virtually everything they'd wanna see is now available, uh, except in that uh, short period between publication and the end of the embargo. Second thing has been the growth of, pub, of um, open access journals, and uh, that is now um, being accelerated, especially by funders in Europe, by having the funders of research say, uh, we don't want the results of the research we pay for to be hidden behind subscription barriers. We want it to be out there um, as soon as possible uh, once the journal has accepted it for publication. And indeed, they've said to their grantees, that if you want to continue receiving grants, grant money from us, you have to ensure that the papers you publish are available in the open access mode. And the preprint movement took off around 2017, uh, thanks to the activities of uh, 
of, of several groups um, and has been remarkably accelerated uh, during the pandemic, which has uh, emphasized the importance of getting information, new information into the hands of everyone as soon as possible, even before review. So now the major uh, preprint archives, such as, uh, as BioArchive, um, are repositories of, of quite a high percentage of, uh, of science, especially the science that's perceived as being particularly important from a public health perspective to be transmitted to the public quickly such as research on coronaviruses, but also research in all other fields that have medical importance. So um, I think all three of these efforts to make the products of scientific work uh, more available more quickly to everyone have ultimately been successful. But this move, at least from my perspective, began in 1999, over 20 years ago, and it's uh, taken a long time to get to where we are now. So what advice did you receive during your career that shaped your professional development or success? I don't know. I never answer questions like that because I don't, I don't, I don't think there's no such thing as general advice. Um, okay. uh, you know, everyone's different. People need mentors and they need advisors, but getting advice, you know, if I say work hard or work on something you'd like to work on or, um, <laughs> Uh, work on something that you'd like to gossip about. I mean, that, 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 that's pretty self-evident. Those are true. Um, they don't have any particular meaning for any particular person. Um, so I think uh, the one thing I would say is if you're uncertain about what you want to do, don't worry. Uh, everybody, everybody's got uncertainty even after they've been working in the field for 20 years. So find yourself some friends who are especially friends who are likable, sensible, and perhaps successful, uh, and talk it over, talk it through. That's always that's always helpful. But uh, I don't have pearls of wisdom that everybody can succeed by following. Is there anything else that we didn't touch upon that uh, we should tell our audience? I think uh, we're exhausting our time. Um, yes, I think you talk longer, of course, about other aspects of science, but um, I think we covered a lot of territory and I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to your customers. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Roberts, for being part of this episode and giving me the opportunity to ask you a few questions so people get to know more about your insights into your research and also the politics of science. My pleasure.